All right, is everybody here? Well, let's open up the evening session. Uh, it's 7 o'clock. We'll start with the reintroduction of commissioners and guests. Starting on my left. Don Budd, Kansas City. Robert Wilson, Pittsburgh. Frank Meyer, Harrington. I'm Gerald Lauber from Topeka. Tom Dill, Salina. Randy Dahl, Leon. Sheila Camus, Commission Secretary. Chris Tamison, Legal Counsel. Uh, Key Saxon. Secretary Pratt. And I think we also have Commissioner Bolton available on Skype. Deborah Bolton, Garden City. Thank you very much. So far, so good. Can you hear us okay, Deborah? I can hear you well. All right. Appreciate you joining us. Um, this would be the time where we would have any. Uh, Public comments on non-agenda items? <clears throat> Are there any public comments on non-agenda items? Well, if not, let's finish up where we left off. Matt Peak. All right, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I'll be talking about the Antelope Regulation 115.25.7 uh, now. Um, the only change I have since the last commission meeting is that we now have permit allocations. Um, we've completed the surveys, and uh, those are provided uh, in Unit 2, 100 firearms permits and 26 muzzleloader permits. In Unit 17, 40 firearms permits and 12 muzzleloader permits. And in Unit 18, 10 firearms permits and 8 muzzleloader permits. These um, recommendations are the same as last year in Units 2 and 17, and this is a decrease by 6 permits in Unit 18, where we had uh, very poor um, fawn production this past year due to the drought. Um, so we're, we're sort of uh, reducing permits by a few now. That the, This year's poor, or last season's poor fawn crop won't be uh, really felt in terms of hunting until uh, the year after next when those animals would have been two and a half years old. So with that, I would turn things back over to the commission. Anybody have any questions from the, or the commission? Have any questions? I do have a comment. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, the, the finder deal, electronic, whatever it is, you, you might look at deer, antelope, and elk while we're at it. Okay. Does a mild winter such as we had, and I assume that's pretty much statewide, does it have a, an effect on? mortality that might offset the poor fawn production? No. Uh, pronghorn are hardy and, you know, they live in Montana and Idaho and Wyoming and they're far more severe winter climates than what we have here. So even a couple years ago when we had a major, major winter out in northwest Kansas, there was very little uh, mortality, almost no mortality associated with weather even under our most severe conditions. When, even when that happens, they're still able to get to um, high elevation corn pivots or, or hay that's been left in the field, that type of thing. They, they congregated around food sources at that time that were associated with people that don't exist in uh, other areas. So it's a combination of their ability to withstand winter and then also the presence of food sources that people have created for them here. Okay. Are there any questions from anybody else? Anybody in the audience? Okay. No more questions from the commission. Do you want to go on with Elk? Yes, sure. So again, I have recommendations um, that we did not have at the last meeting. We're proposing that 10 any elk permits and 15 antlerless elk permits be authorized. And this is also uh, the same number that we had um, that we had available last season. So no change in that regard. And that's that's the only addition to this regulation. So I would take questions. Any questions from the commission for Matt? 
Any questions from the audience? Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's see. Jim, I think you're back again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. We're talking about fall turkey season bag limits and permits. And before I get into the recommendation, I just wanted to give you a little update on, on what happened last fall. I crunched through a few of the numbers yesterday. I don't have harvest estimates yet, but we sold 12,914 permits last fall. That's almost identical to the previous year. And we sold those to 10,025 individual hunters, and they had a 36.1% success rate. I suspect when I crunch the numbers, the total harvest will be really similar to, to what we've seen in the past. So um, we've talked quite a bit about populations in the, sta the, the past. We still have our strongest turkey populations in the central part of the state right now. Uh, we are recovering a bit in the east due to better production last spring, so things are looking up there. As far as the recommendation is concerned, we're recommending that we adopt six new hunt units uh, as opposed to the four that we have right now. <clears throat> and they are shown in figure three in your briefing book materials. And we're going that route so that we can better align our hunt units with our management units, which will allow us to better use our data to make recommendations on, on harvest. And by adopting these new units, we will be moving towards an adaptive harvest strategy that's laid out in Appendix 1, where we'll be moving regulations up, up or down a hierarchy of different packages based on spring resident hunter success. Uh, for example, if, if hunt success stays above 60% for three consecutive years in a particular unit, we'll go up one notch on that hierarchy. If it's below 55% for two consecutive years, we'll go down a notch on that hierarchy is, is what, we're, what we're moving towards. Um, with that, I guess I'll take any questions. When these triggers, when these triggers are enacted, do, do you have to come back to us for action? Yes, these, this, this is just guidelines that we'll, okay. we'll be adopting. We'll still have to bring recommendations to the commission. Okay. But we'll have a strategy at least now about when and how to do that. Okay. How many units did we have last year? Four. We've had four, four ever since I've been with the department. Okay, so you've added two new units and kind of redrew boundaries. Right. And, and like I said, we've done that so I can match them up with our management units better. So when the, the guy goes in and buys his tag and he wants, he's going to have to say, I want to hunt unit three or I'll, I can buy a statewide? No, the, the permit, the first permit will still be valid in any unit that, that offers over-the-counter permits. So, for example, if we, right now what we're, rec we're proposing, it'd be, they'd be valid anywhere except unit four, which has a closed season. In the fall. Okay, so the the, the permitting will be the same. The, the permitting will be the same. Okay. You know, we, in the future, as we make changes up and down that hierarchy, the game tags may be valid or invalid depending on which which higher which package a particular unit falls into. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Are there any more questions for Jim? Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I'd like for you to, uh, so we could hear. Hey, John, my name's Dan Roman. I just wondered right along since we've been developing the turkey seasons, why don't we encourage um, more shooting of uh, the hens in the fall? The gobblers are in, in gobbler groups, you know, bachelor groups. Well, it's pretty easy to lay down four or five of them or whatever the deal is with right. the two guys. I'm wondering why we don't somehow, whether it's a price reduction or something, to encourage people to shoot the hens because that's what the issue is. Well, I mean, they're allowed to shoot hens now, of course, but they select gobblers. Right. So, you know, I, I think, first of all, a lot of the, the pr problem that, that people perceive to be happening with turkeys isn't real crop damage and that sort of thing. There's quite a few scientific studies to support that. But, so we, we don't want to limit opportunity regardless of species. And I think landowners don't care if they're shooting a, a gobbler or a hen either. So it, I encourage people to shoot hens. Right. But the fact of the matter is we don't have a whole lot of fall turkey hunters, period. And, and uh, 
I think most landowners are happy regardless of what they take. So, okay. so that would be the second part of my question then is I'm just wondering if you'd increase the number of hunters, if there could be some kind of price incentive. For example, it's pretty expensive to, to you know, to buy turkey tags. I can go buy a turkey cheaper than a shoot a bird. Right. So I've often wondered why don't you do 20 bucks or 25 bucks for four tags? Well, we've talked about those sort of things in the past. We've got a turkey committee made up of department staff from all across the state. and We meet a couple times a year and talk about potential regulation changes and I'll add that to our list, something we can talk well, about in the future. You don't have to add it. I'm just, sure. I'm just no, we talk right about along. Anytime somebody brings a recommendation to me or, or an idea, I usually take it running through our turkey committee. So we'll talk about it. Okay. That's not a problem. Thank you. Uh -huh. Michael? Jim, I got a question on Unit 4. Uh-huh. Um, that was still draw this year, correct? That's right. Do you know how it went for number of applicants versus number of permits that were available? I know we met demand. It seems like okay. there was about, we offer 500 permits. I think there was about 80 left over. Okay. Is there any thought down the road of not even making have to apply for that or you just going to keep it kind of as is? Well, th that's one thing I should mention. If we, if the commission adopts these new unit boundaries for fall, we're going to come back with a recommendation for new unit boundaries in the spring. And at that time, we'll, we'll rec be recommending starting regulation package for each, each one of those new units. It may be the same as it is now, or we may decide to make some changes. R regardless, based on our hunt success, and, and looking at the data, I think we'll be upping, going to over-the-counter in the next couple of years once this adaptive harvest strategy is adopted. On Unit 4? On Unit 4. So, okay, thank you. So we're moving that direction, I think. Any other questions from the audience? <clears throat> Any more questions from the Commission? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, 11525 9A, which is uh, this is in a workshop session. It's the uh, similar regulation to 259 that we'll uh, go into a public hearing on tonight, but this one deals just with Fort Riley. And we've had discussions with the staff at Fort Riley. Uh, the items that uh, we have for discussion, uh, they would like the regular archery season and muzzleloader season the same as is listed on in 25.9 with some uh, uh, changes, and I'll get to those later. Uh, on the extended firearm season, they would like the same dates as we have in 25.9, but not to include the special extended season that's available in Unit uh, 8. Uh, 7, 8, and 15. So they would have similar to the rest of the state other than those three units. They would like a um, uh, season for youth and people with disabilities, also the same as 25-9, but they would like four additional days, um, October 5th through October 8th, the Columbus Day weekend. Um, they have a they have 12 day firearm season for uh, people on base and and else uh, other people that hunt on the area. The firearm dates are November 23rd through the 25th and December 15th through the 23rd. They're requesting three additional days in January, January 19th, 20th, and 21st. And those would be three days uh, when only personnel, uh, as authorized by the fort, could hunt for antler deer. In addition, they would like an extension, some additional days of archery season, 16 days early, from September 1st to September 16th, and from January 14th to the 31st, when antler deer could be taken with archery equipment, and this would be for individuals um, by uh, uh, special authorization from Fort Riley. 
uh, that's um, that's the their uh, request at this time. Are there any questions or comments, Mr. Chairman? Um, Lloyd, uh, the Fort Riley. How many permits do we sell, or what's the usage on, at Fort Riley? Uh, they we don't have a separate permit that is sold just to Fort Riley. It would be the same uh, permit is in our um, uh, in our for example whitetail either sex or the whitetail antlerless only uh, Sean can you tell us uh, how many days or how many people are actually hunting on the fort they have a check station check people in and out Yep. Sean Stratton, Fort Riley Conservation. Uh, we have we had last year a total of uh, 763 deer hunters on the installation. That includes military, civilian, retirees, non-residents, whole kit and caboodle. So. And so 763, how many deer were taken? <clears throat> we had 354 deer harvested on the installation last year. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Sean, don't go to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lloyd, are, are all soldiers considered to be resident? Uh, yes, uh, a, a, a personnel stationed on Fort Riley uh, could get a resident deer okay. permit. Okay. Sean, what? What's the reasoning for asking for the gun season from the 23rd to the 25th of November? Um, the 23rd through the 25th is Thanksgiving holiday weekend. <clears throat> we have to focus our firearms deer season days around the training holidays of our soldiers. If we were concurrent with the state of Kansas, the majority of our installation would not be available to firearms deer hunt because of the training that's occurring. So we focus our firearm deer days around the training holidays. Would you be opposed to making that an antlerless only season? Um, those, those particular days? I believe, uh, yes, right now we would be. We've had that uh, Thanksgiving, we've had that Thanksgiving weekend, uh, the 10 years that I've been at the installation, we've had that season out there. And it goes back, I believe, probably to the 80s, probably, Lloyd. Long time. Yeah, oh, we've been. had this in place already then. Yeah. Like, oh. Yes. Oh, well, I thought this was something new. I'm new, so I thought it was new. <laughs> 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 okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Oh. Any, other, any other questions? Any questions for Sean? Any more questions for Lloyd? Okay, now into the public hearing. I think that's correct. So, KR 115.42. Okay, this is a permanent regulation, and uh, uh, we have some uh, changes uh, that we've discussed in. In previous workshops, um, one of the first changes is uh, just some uh, clarification. Uh, the carcass tag uh, uh, should be applied to the carcass in a visible manner. We're just describing it a little bit differently. Um, we're allowing the, the um, this regulation was changed a few years ago, two years ago, I guess, or maybe three, when we started the um, the uh, photo registration system and uh, we're, tr we're still working on that and trying to clarify it and the, uh, the major change that we're making we're shifting some uh, places where it occurs but the, uh, the main change is on page two and it's, uh, it's where it will allow the permittee to uh, retain photographs necessary for electronic registration without registering the animal. They could, for example, debone uh, the deer and transport the deer without the head attached, 
if they had the photographs necessary to photo register it. This gets us around the problem that occurs when uh, individuals were unable to use their smartphone or connect to the internet and register their deer. Uh, now uh, it, this gives them a, a way of processing that deer in the field, reducing it down to uh, boned meat, and uh, uh, walking out without those other parts of the deer attached. Uh, another item that we are removing from this regulation is on page three, and this is a holdover from many, many years ago, where our uh, carcass tag and our deer permit were physically attached to each other. Uh, and the, uh, the regulation was that you couldn't remove the carcass tag from your permit that invalidated your uh, carcass tag. With our current day system where we get multiple carcass tags and permits all coming in a string, uh, that had been corrected in another part. We're just removing it from this regulation. And then finally, in this regulation, we have a section that says, no individual shall copy, reproduce, or possess any copy or reproduction of a big game or wild turkey permit or carcass tag. Uh, those are the significant changes in, uh, that we have made in that regulation. Are there any questions or comments? So, in if I understand this, let's say I shoot a turkey in the field and I carefully lay to be prepared for electronic registration, you would lay your signed carcass tag in a manner that can prove and, and show the sex of the, of the turkey and take a picture. Then I could go ahead and take it back, bone it, do just, whatever I wanted to do. And just take the breast. For take example. the breast, but I. But as long as I have that picture of your tag, of your and tag, of, and the and the animal, and of the bird with the beard attached or okay. present, just like your and you, um, you would photo, you would register it after that fact. But this would allow you to take it out of the field. Okay, that's correct. Are there any questions for Lloyd from the commission on this one? Are there any questions from the audience? Well, now this is one where we, we vote, and I don't think there's any amendments no, not for this on this one. <coughs> so, could I have a motion that we approve this? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve KAR 115-4-4 as printed with changes. 4-2. It's 4-2, but... Or 4-2, yeah. Can I have a second? A second, Mr. Chairman. Will you call the roll? Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Budd? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Okay. 115 4 4. Big game legal equipment and taking methods. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this also is a. Uh, uh, we have today, tonight, a. Uh, a uh, regulation that has been stamped and approved by the Attorney General and the Department of Administration. This is a, a regulation that includes uh, Section um, uh, 3A, um, Section F3, uh, which will allow uh, anyone with a youth big game permit or an individual 55 years old or older uh, to use a crossbow, and we've specified criteria of that crossbow, um, they would be able to use that uh, during an archery uh, season. 
We'll also allow that, uh, that crossbow and those uh, people to use uh, archery equipment during a muzzleloader season, as similar to uh, the way we have in, in other, um, with our other archery equipment. Um, then we have uh, a section uh, on page four, it's section E, and it's, um, uh, this is uh, one that has been giving us some problems with coming up with a solution, and it's one that we have an amendment for you. Uh, the way it is in your briefing book is it states big game permittees shall possess hunting equipment um, while hunting only as authorized by this regulation and by the most restrictive big game permit in possession while hunting. And that was struck in this particular, uh, in this version. The amendment to that puts that right back in as it is. Are there any questions or comments on uh, this, on Regulation 115.4-4. I have one, Lloyd. I don't understand quite the amendment issue. Or Chris, would you? The amendment issue comes from the discussion that we had at the last commission meeting and ultimately the legislation that just passed, House Bill 2491, where the proponents uh, of that legislation also wanted to see if the commission would strike this language and as it turns out based on the timing of the regs i had to in order to act on it i had to put that in there so the commission could have acted on it tonight but what we're recommending is to leave it as it to, to amend it back so to the that way we it won't be counter to statute that allows handguns no uh it would still restrict for example, rifles. I, I understand, okay. but I mean, it's because of that, the fact that the <coughs> the statute allows handguns, while previously anticipated to allow any any guns, was amended, compromised to handguns, but that would be in conflict with this. It'll supersede whatever we put in here, the handgun provision that's in statute. That's So that's not the issue. But we need to put it back in to say you can't take your AR-15 to the stand with you when you're bow hunting. Okay. Well, questions from the commission? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, so when is... When does crossbow allowed then, uh, as indicated in both of these, <coughs> Lloyd? Okay, a crossbow would be allowed for any individual who has a youth big game permit or any person who is 55 years old or older. When? I'm sorry, what, when? What seasons? Yes. This would be the archery season starting in 2000, this fall. Okay. So the standard archery season allows it for those individuals. For those individuals, okay. that's correct. And Mr. Chairman, just so I understand, so 115-4-4, Chris, you're not recommending that. You're recommending 4A. Am I? No. No? Uh, Both 4 and 4-4 4 and 4-4A 4 are two separate regulations, and the recommendation is before you both of them need the amendment the language is the exact same one deals with big game one deals with turkey oh i see okay we're going to act on both of them gotcha okay thank you i would i kind of disagree with the 55 i'd like to see that 65 you know you're still a kid at 65 I may be. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 60, but I think 55 is too young. But uh, we may not be able to get that through the legislature. I don't know, but uh, personal feeling. Okay. Mr. Other questions? Yes. Mine's back for Chris again, just so I'm clear on the amendment. So. We're saying we would want to do the amendment to add it back in because we had to strike it from the original that we had to send to them for approval. Right. It's somewhat complex. 
in that if you don't notice if you don't notice up a change in the reg you potentially run afoul of some legal considerations that the legislature passed last year used to be you could amend on the fly now you can't so I, i've got it so in essence we really want to do the when the vote comes we want to vote for the amendment first right and then we'll vote for the other right okay. and then Continuing on, I guess, on my part, just simply the fact that I think that the department's recommendation 16 and under and 55 <laughs> makes sense. Um, you know, I want to retain as many aging sportsmen as we can. I want to encourage the youth to participate. I'm not limiting anybody's choice. I just want to still enhance the opportunity, so I think it's reasonable. Having been to down to the... Uh, legislature and sat through a couple of the uh, or at least sat through one of the Senate bill hearings I think this is something we really need to do so that we can actually regulate it and not be legislated uh, I concur Commissioner Dill uh, if we don't pass this we will have crossbows in the state anyway and we may have them on a more liberal framework than uh, than, than what we're going to propose. Uh, at this point in time, whether or not I'm for or against crossbows has now become an immaterial matter, in my opinion, because I think we have got the legislature to hold up passing their no-holds-barred crossbow legislation, legislation to see what we do. And if we do something and we word it our way, I think that's a preferred alternative than having to have their statutes trump our regs. And you never know what may happen as this bill comes flying out of committee someplace on Monday and we get it uh, uh, involuntarily placed upon us. Um, you know, I mentioned at the last committee, the last commission meeting, you know, there's a chance of this, and uh, I think some may have underestimated the amount of momentum that uh, crossbows have in this area. And uh, I don't see where we have a lot of good alternatives. I'd rather have something that we can live with and monitor than have something that we just have to accept. I'd rather be able to control our destiny to some extent. So that's my feeling. If I could follow up again, I mean, I think it's the right thing to do. The reality is, is quite honestly, we could still do this, pass this this evening, and come Monday or Tuesday, if I understand correctly, we still might have all-inclusive no matter what. So I think it's the right way to do this. Well, I'll vote for it. I just had to say my piece. Okay. Well, I understand. That's my that's my privilege, isn't it? That is. Yeah. Other questions from the commission? Questions from the public? Comments? Yes, please. Come up and <clears throat> I understand the compromise issue. I think that's necessary in order to do it. But I have a couple of questions. You talk about the 55 to 65 issue. Anybody 55 right now can go to their family doctor and get a permit to, to disability permit to hunt with a crossbow. If a 55-year-old person buys a crossbow, spends $1,000 on equipment, he may use it for a while. If a under 16 year old buys a crossbow and his dad spends a thousand dollars on equipment, when he hits 16 years old, he can't use it anymore. A few years down the road, they're going to come back on us and say, "We need it. What are we going to do with all these crossbows we we bought?" That's my part of the of the youth part. Uh, not that you know. I know that there are some people that'll have their youth go out and and uh, use uh, uh, under powered bows and so forth, which shouldn't be done. That's all a matter of peril or whoever taught them to hunt. But but the, the crossbow does help those people. But I'm more worried about what's going to happen when all those people turn 16 that went out and spent this $1,000 on equipment and then they can't use it anymore until they reach 65. That's not going to happen. 
I mean, I think that we're, I think we need to compromise. Maybe we can do it by pulling the 65, like you said, down to the 55, but don't involve the youth in the crossbow issue. Not that I'm against the youth, <laughs> so I'm just saying that somebody's going to have to, somebody's going to want to use that bow after they buy it, uh, I think, when they turn 16. Sir, could just you state your name, please? Dennis Carnine. Thank you. Sorry. Are you saying that then you would like to have crossbows with no age limitation? No, no, I'll go with the seniors. Like you said, I just am saying that the youth part is, I mean, I'm all for youth. I've got kids I talk to, too, so that's not my problem. It's uh, The problem is that there's, you know, to get a crossbow set up, it's $1,000. Well, if you get, you know, some parent spends $1,000, he's not planning on not being able to use it when that kid turns 16. But they say he buys it for him at 15 years old, now he's got to sell it. He can still use it during rifle season. He could, and but it's longer. doubtful that he yeah. will. I mean, hopefully we're, you know, but it maybe, maybe they would. I mean, it can still be used. Right now it can be used during rifle season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Either way, yeah, that's not your, a change. Your logic makes sense. I understand what you're saying. And I'm not one to not compromise. Oh, no, I, I understand. I just think that it's just not a good idea to exclude youth from this because we also want to try to recruit young hunters yeah but and i sec and i also think that to exclude youth from this deal would probably be politically unpalatable as well and uh, i think personally i think this is about as restrictive as we should try to vote for uh what about lowering it to a lower age, like the 12 that we used to have, or something like that. Anyone, any youth that's under 12. Well, I think that's too. I think that's too young. I, well, I, mean, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, I just think there's going to be a glut of in a couple of years or five years. There's going to be a glut of people come back and say we want to go ahead and open the season on that. And it may happen through the legislature anyway. So I'm, it's probably I'm going to happen anyway. But I'm we might be able to, we might be able to slow it down at this rate. And you know, we also once we have this opened on a somewhat restricted basis it would give us an opportunity to watch it watch it and determine now, i'm not sure that you're going to see other than the initial disappointment i'm not sure you're going to see a huge number of people go out and change uh their their method of hunting there'll be some not too many but i think it's it's more of an uh, an emotional fair chase sporting issue more so than it is a concern about over harvesting of a resource and maybe a little bit of an issue of it'll get a little more crowded in certain areas i'm just more concerned about what's going to happen when they turn 16. i don't feel like they're going to infringe on us that much the youth especially because any of the youth is going to have their parents with them they don't they're out there anyway but you know we're teaching archery in schools the state's been behind that Every, you know everything has been oriented toward the archery and now as far as young, the youth and now we're going to say well I guess you don't have to shoot a bow anymore you can just use a, yeah. a crossbow anyway that's just my opinion I, I just I, wanted to throw it out there and I appreciate your, your thoughts any more questions Uh, Marvin Whitehead, uh, Kansas Bow Hunters Association. And after listening to Chris's comments here this afternoon and the, the uh, possible legislative action that's going on, you know, I've, I've been all against, uh, you know, getting tired of compromising. I've, I've been getting tired of compromising. I'm not against it. But uh, I'm beginning to think that I guess maybe it would be a little bit better to compromise than be force-fed something in a few days. But uh, kind of like the other gentleman said, uh, no matter what happens here, uh, if, we're, if you're not uh, talking crossbows next year or the year after with the youth, I'll eat my dirty old camo hat. 
<laughs> and it's pretty dirty. But but with the, I mean that that's the only downside I can see to the under 16. And as you all know, one or two people holler, and seems like it gets as much discussion as a hundred people hollering. But thank you. Thank you. Other comments? You know, while he's coming up, to address that under 16 issue, if we all think about it with our kids when they were growing up from 12 to 16, look at what we spend on sports uniforms, 4-H stuff, things like that. A lot more than a thousand dollars. If I could have got rid of my son and only spent a thousand dollars on him from twelve to sixteen that I threw away, I'd be the happiest guy in the world, you know. So I don't know that the money's going to be that big issue because we spend so much on our kids anyway. I think the issue is just like Tom said, getting the kids involved. I think that's more important than a dollar to spend. Bob Griffin, Bob Griffin from Lebo. Um, I guess one of my first questions is, you spoke about watching the effects of the crossbows, what, what effect they have on the, on the deer herd and, and the bow hunters. I have a hard time understanding how we're going to watch the effects of that when we have no idea of who's using a crossbow, because our tags can be used for any weapon during any season in <coughs> most any part of the state now. So how can we tell how many crossbow hunters we have where the deer are being taken from, we have no idea. Well, among other things, I think, granted, we have to rely on hunter surveys, but I think Lloyd has some information that will indicate about what percentage of our hunters are using crossbows now. And assuming that the same relative level of veracity occurs on future uh, surveys, we're going to know how much crossbow usage rises. Right now, we believe the crossbows represent what less than three percent of the preferred or the 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 harvest tools. Right. It was about um, 300, uh, 350 animals uh, uh, out of eighty nine thousand or ninety four thousand. I forget which it was, but something like that. That's what we estimated it to be. And we expect that, there, that that number will probably increase, or at least I expect it will increase, but I don't know how much. And that's what I meant by we would have a very legitimate reason to wait just a little bit longer before the next round, before he has to eat his hat, that uh, uh, this make. I'm not saying it won't come back. I'm not going to take that bet. But I think we will have an opportunity to get a reasonable fix on how many people are using crossbows. Right. I guess the big issue is I just I, I would like to have a better system for us to be able to understand and manage the resource that we have. Um, understanding where the deer are being taken from in the state with this, you know, statewide any any weapon any season tag. I just think we have a hard time trying to manage manage our resource. Um, you know, we don't we don't limit an area. You know, you used to have to draw a tag, and it was restricted. Or that you know, as a rifle hunter, you had to select the units that you hunted in. Where you know, now it's a statewide tag. I just you know, have a hard time understanding how we can manage our resource with a statewide tag the way it is. How many members do you guys have in your association? <sighs> Right now, about 575. And of those, do any of them use crossbows now? Currently, right now, no. No. Do you think, with all the talk about it, is there any talk within your organization of somebody maybe hanging up the compound and using a crossbow for trial even? Um, I highly doubt it. Um, if, if for some reason they became physically unable to shoot a bow, as a matter of fact, the lady that got me involved in the KBA got to that point after three soldier, shoulder surgeries, she could no longer shoot a regular bow. So she started shooting a crossbow. Uh, she's no longer a member because her health has gotten bad enough that she just dropped out of, out of the organization completely. Um, that was an issue that we d discussed at our last uh, banquet. And uh, right now I don't can't currently say how the KBA is going to stand when this crossbow issue passes as far as our membership allowing individuals that aren't physically unable to shoot a regular bow that choose to use a crossbow. Um, 
So that's something we're going to discuss within our own organization. Well, the reason I asked that question, and I regret not coming, I really wanted to come to that meeting, but I was out of town because I was going to, I had a lot of questions that I wanted to answer from the bow hunters. But if you've got that many guys that are <clears throat> interested in the organization or that passionate about the sport, and you think of those 500 plus people that you're going to have zero to not measurable number go to a crossbow then is your fear that the gun hunter is going to get a crossbow and hunt during archery season is is that what what you're thinking well, certainly, most of your most of you. I mean, the number of rifle hunters that have already picked up have, have made the effort to pick up a regular bow and bow hunt has increased already. Mm -hmm. um, so now you're going to now you're going to put a weapon in front of the rifle hunters that are 55 or older. That uh, you know now they can hunt without having to practice and develop the skills to shoot a regular bow. They're going to pick up a weapon that's fairly identical other than the fact that it shoots a bow bolt instead of a bullet um, to a rifle um, I just I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't they're going to be allowed the opportunity to hunt the rut and if they don't fill their tag this is another issue if they don't fill their tag during the archery season they pick up their rifle and they fill it during the rifle season with the any season tag well uh, I agree to a point but I just and I archery hunt, so I, under, I understand what you're talking about. But I just think it's going to be, like Gerald says, I think we're probably going to have a minimal number of new people using a crossbow that we don't have now, that it's going to be almost immeasurable. We'll probably, Lloyd, I would say, you're going to have, if this passes and, and this happens, we'll have some kind of data probably next year to really know what we've got we'll know how many of the people in that 55 and older or 16 and under uh, uh, used uh, crossbows in addition to what we're already using them and we've and, got three years of that already right and then the potential fear of and an understandable fear of the next step is well let's open it up for everything We'll have a bar the next time we talk about this, I think, on what they're doing and how many people are doing it. Right, I understand And so that. I think we'll, we'll have a lot, everyone, us, and the legislature both will have a lot more information to work with than we do now. Right, and I understand all of that. I just, you know, once again, I want to, I'm voicing my concerns, right. my opinions. Um, and concerns about the resource. That, that's my biggest concern. I want I want this this resource to be here when my daughter grows up and my grandchildren get here. Thank you for your time. All right. Yes. I can say one more thing. Sorry. <clears throat> Dennis Carnine again from Tonganoxie. Say, I had a little bit of experience this year with crossbows. I second day of deer season i rolled my atv and tore both my rotator cuffs off so had surgery on both of them and and was able to hunt with a crossbow now the rifle people i think what we're concerned about because i'm part of the kba too i've been with them for 40 years but um the concern is that the the, the, the rifle hunters are going to jump into the rut with crossbows as you were saying okay from my experience with the crossbows I used, and I, I went with the cheapest and the most expensive at Cabela Sales because I had two different people I borrowed them from. I wasn't going to buy one. Anyway, uh, both of them were 50-yard weapons. They've got four dots on their scope, and there's, that's just where they're at. I mean, you shoot them from 20 yards to 50 yards. And uh, there are some crossbows out there that you can watch on YouTube that'll shoot a full-length arrow on an 8K47 frame and all that stuff but most crossbows don't shoot any faster than the compounds do and so what i think is going to happen if if this ever gets to a point like your 55 year olds jump in with crossbows and decide they can hunt if they're rifle hunters and they've been rifle hunters they sit on the edge of a field and they shoot an animal out there 100 yards and they're going to find that they sit on the edge of the field and they can't shoot that animal out there at 100 yards so everybody that buys crossbows this year, in a couple of years, you're going to see them in the bargain cave at Cabela's. Now, that's, I don't think it's going to be big an impact, as you're saying. I think, I think I agree with what you're saying. That's what I want to bring it back up for. 
the worry the worry I have, like I said, is the is the youth deal. That's more introducing them to crossbows at that age is is to me a way to put a foot in the door to want them to use it all all through the season. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, the group, Al? I'm Al Ward. I just recently purchased a crossbow with uh, a good package. It cost me less than $500. It didn't cost $1,000. I'm 73 years old. I have trouble pulling back a regular bow. I'm not a deer hunter. I'm a turkey hunter. I want to shoot my turkeys with a bow. If they're concerned about the loss of the deer population, we need to do something about coyotes and bobcats. They are going to kill many more fawns each spring than all the bow hunters and rifle hunters put together. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name's Doug Peterman, Topeka, Kansas. I wasn't going to speak, but now I'm here. I'm 63 years old and I shoot a crossbow. I shot a compound bow for 30 some years and I miss it. The state was good enough to give me a permit five or six years ago to shoot with one. I still have to wear scent. I still have to watch out for my sound. I have to, wa I have to watch out for the wind. I still have to do all the things that I did when I compound bow hunted. Before I compound bow hunted, I recurved hunted in the 60s. I miss compound bow hunting, but I have fibromyalgia. I didn't go to the doctor one time and complain to him and get a permit as folks have put on the websites that I did. Uh, I had to go many times. I don't have any strength and I can't draw anything back. I wanted to hunt. I did not harvest a deer this year. I have not harvested a trophy deer. I've harvested two antlered deer the past several, over the past five or six years, and several does. I shoot with a the compound, I use a trigger. A com um, I'm sorry, with a with a crossbow, with a compound bow, you're getting about as close to that as you can with a release. You have a trigger. You have fiber optics. Uh, you have laser attachments that you can put on a compound bow. Now, I'm not in favor of one way or the other on it but I did want to stand up and speak and say I don't know what the fear is of all the compound bow hunters I'm certainly not thinning down the herd I have to I have to to get up every morning early I have to set in the tree late I have to do all the things that the that the regular people do the regular archery hunters I practice all of the time I don't see myself going on to public land and being a hazard or uh, taking up any more space or any more deer than somebody that shoots a compound bow. So I have the same hunting season as a compound bow. I can start in mid-September and hunt all of the way through, through rifle season, through rut, even a couple even a couple of times after the first of the year so if that's not enough time for somebody to take a deer with a compound bow exclusively having the rut then i don't know how much more time they need i don't care whether or not you pass this or or pass it i hope that i will be able to continue to hunt for as long as my health will let me but I do not see that there is a fear to crossbows. There was a there was a fear of compound bows when uh, when the uh, everyone was shooting recurves and they first came out with them. I would love to have another compound bow, but that's not part of it. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Okay. Any more 
questions from anybody? Tim? Tim Don, just from Miller Rail Quality Deer Management Association. I just wanted to make a few comments. Uh, the main thing through the Quality Deer Management Association, no matter uh, if crossbows get passed by legislature or what you do tonight, the most important thing is is we uh, um, maintain th that we have the future of deer hunting and that we properly manage it in the future. And by and able to do that, we need to have good statistics for Mr. Fox here so he can make good biological management decisions in the future in order to protect the quality of our white-tailed deer herd here in Kansas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more comments? Mike? I, I just have a question that I need to clear up. I'm not going to follow up things, or I've forgotten. Is it, it's not currently legal to use a crossbow during the muzzleloader season unless you have the... We have the muzzleloader and the archery at the same time now. Correct. That's okay. correct. Is it legal for somebody to use a crossbow during that season if they do not have one of the special permits? No. Okay, thank you. And I'm <coughs> confused on how we are defining the young age group. It's 16 and under. No. What, what, where does the youth season fit into this, Chris? I, I haven't had to... Go ahead. If you have a youth permit, because people who buy a youth permit might change their... Go from 15 to 16. So if, as long as you have the youth permit, you're able to use... Crossbow. That's the way the regulations written. Can a youth permit be sold? To, I'm sorry, I'm not following this. Can a youth permit be sold to somebody who is already 16? No. It, it's it's 15 and under on the youth permits. Okay. Correct. Thank you. All right. Any more discussion? I think we're getting close to a vote here. Well, I'd like for somebody to make a motion that we uh, pass this then before we vote on this we'll have the amendment I don't think anybody's going to argue about the amendment I don't think there's much controversy so could I have somebody move that we pass 115 4-4 Mr. Chairman I move that we pass 115 4-4 may I have a second second alright now before we have a vote, I would like to see that we have the amendment. I'd like a mo motion to pass the amendment to reinsert that language. Mr. Chairman, I move the amendment of KR 115-4-4. And can I have a second? A second. Okay, now we need to have the roll call vote on the amendment. Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Budd? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Now we'd like the roll call on the vote on 115 4 4 with the amendment included. Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Budd? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. All right. The next deal is basically the same thing, I don't. but for the turkey statute. Do you want to explain anything, Lloyd, or is it just it, exactly the same? It is the same. Uh, some of the numbers are a little bit different because uh, just uh, the way it's written uh, uh, with muzzleloader and other uh, items that are not in, in the, the wild turkey regulation, the items under consideration are the same as in 115.4-4. And the amendment also is the same as it was in the other one. It is a different number. It's, it's item D this time as opposed to item E. But uh, otherwise, it's the same. Is there any discussion? Any questions from the commission? Any questions from the audience? 
let's have the see if we can't get this one done as efficiently as the last one. Can I have a motion that we approve this? Mr. Chairman, I'll move that we pass or adopt KAR 115-4-4A. May I have a second? Second. second. Okay, would somebody like to move that we include the amendment? Mr. Chairman, I move the amendment. We have a second? Second. second. Roll call vote on the amendment. Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Budd? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Now, a roll call vote on 115-4-4A with the amendment included. Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Budd? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7-0. We're moving right along. You got the next one there, Lloyd? Yes, I do. The next regulation, um, for the public hearing is 115.25.9. This is deer uh, open season, the season dates, bag limits, permits, etc. Uh, and we, the um, most of this is the same as it was last year, with the changes that occur uh, just due to the calendar year being different. Archery would be September 17th through the th December 31st. Um, our uh, season, uh, the urban antlerless only season would be January 14th, 2013 to January 31st. We have seasons for Fort Leavenworth and also for Smoky Valley, uh, Smoky Hill Air National Guard area, this, those two subunits. They're both 12 days in length, but they're broken up a little bit differently for each unit. Uh, we have an urban firearm deer season, October 13th through October 21st, 2012. The muzzleloader season would be September 17th to September 30th, 2012. Uh, the um, oh, I forgot to mention the firearm deer dates for places other than Smoky Valley, uh, Smoky Hill Air National Guard, and um, Fort Leavenworth would be November 28th through December 9th. Uh, the season for um, youth and people with disabilities uh, would be September 8th through September 16th in all deer management units. Uh, the rest of the items are very similar to uh, previous years as far as um, uh, most everything until, until we get into the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, units for um, whitetail uh, extended season. Uh, and the number of permits that would be authorized in those seasons. Uh, the extended season would be January 1st through January 13th, and it would be uh, statewide um, in those areas. Any unfilled uh, deer permits would convert to a whitetail antlerless only permit. <laughs> Uh, and it would be a firearm permit. The units, if there were units attached uh, in the initial permit, they would remain restricted to those units. Uh, we have a special extended firearm season in deer management units 7, 8, and 15. That's an additional seven days, January 14th to January 20th. Um, let's see. Uh, this year, uh, in, the, in previous years, we have allowed a uh, second whitetail antlerless permit to be used on um, Cedar Bluff. Uh, this year, we're uh, allowing whitetail antlerless permits uh, in additional units up in the Northwest, and we're also allowing up to five deer 
to be uh, taken on Cedar Bluff, five whitetail antler list here, Glen Elder, Canopolis, Kerwin, Lovewell, Norton, Webster, and Wilson Wildlife Area. There is one item that we do need to note at this time. There is a misspelling in your regulation on Canopolis. Uh, and we just need to note that uh, that it is a misspelling. It has been corrected, I believe, in the, your, um, the uh, uh, secretary's orders that will come out after this. Uh, the, um, uh, we have three maps for you uh, also that show where those whitetail antlerless permits may be used. Uh, the first one is good statewide, including all department lands. The second one is good also statewide and uh, those various uh, public areas in the northwest and north central part of the state. And the, um, uh, the last three whitetail antlerless permits are valid in deer management unit one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, and 19. New units uh, for those permits include deer management unit one, two, three, four, five, and 11. Are there any questions on the, uh, the recommendation and the regulation as it is uh, uh, presented to you for 115.25.9? Uh, any questions from the commission? Any questions from the public? Okay. Aye. Amendment. We're going to do a conceptual amendment to fix Canopolis. Okay. A virtual amendment. Right. It's not really important. But okay. I would like a motion that we approve this uh, section. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve KAR 115-25-9. May I have a second? Second. Aye. I would also now like to have a motion that we uh, properly spell Canopolis. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me how to spell it. You got Deborah moved in. All right. Can I have a second? Second. All right. Who seconded? I'm sorry. Robert? I'd like a roll call vote on the spelling of Canopolis. <laughs> Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Bud? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Lauber? Yes. Pass 7 0. Now a roll call vote on the rig. Commissioner Bolton? Yes. Commissioner Bud? Yes. Commissioner Dill? Yes. Commissioner Dahl? Yes. Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Mr. Lauber. Yes. Pass 7 0. All right. Secretary's orders. Lloyd. Okay. The Secretary's orders. Um, this year we're uh, recommending an additional uh, 926 non resident deer permits. Uh, and those vary, the increases vary from uh, six units will have no increase at all. Um, uh, four units will have a 5% increase, uh, five units will have a 10% increase, and three units have a 15% increase. And those are based on uh, changes in the deer population and other uh, management factors that we consider uh, for those. We have not changed any of the other uh, numbers. We have open um, uh, availability for uh, either sex deer for residents and a variety of different ways that uh, a hunter may pick their one uh, permit that will allow them to take a, an antler deer. 
um, and we have uh, the corresponding, um, we have some values also in here, the same numbers for um, uh, the either species, either sex uh, deer permits for residents, and also the same numbers as we had last year for the either species antlerless only deer permits and the corresponding um, non-resident either species <coughs> antlerless only permits, which are, uh, they're generally 20% of the, uh, what the residents level is. Are there any questions on the secretary's orders? I have a couple, or uh, one. Which, which unit had the biggest increase in non-resident permits? The three, uh, units that had 15% increase were Deer Management Unit 1, uh, 3, and Deer Management Unit 7. The one that I get most of the letters and calls about is uh, Unit 16. Did we have a significant increase there? We had a five per, the recommendation is for a 5% increase in deer management unit 16. Okay. Now we don't vote on this. This is for informational purposes. And if somebody has a complaint, they need to contact Mr. Jennison. <laughs> yeah, the boy Lloyd gets a real deal out of this. <laughs> Lloyd, I want to thank you for this process. As, as a new commissioner, you took a very complicated issue and made it pretty simple for us. Thank you. Okay, I think that's it for Lloyd. And Thank you. We're sort of nearing the end for us. Um, do we need to talk about future meeting dates, future meeting times? I think we're set for the end of the year. We've got um, April 26th at the Great Plains Nature Center in Wichita. We've got June 24 or 21st, excuse me, at Cabela's in Kansas City. We've got August 23rd at the Wetland Education Center in Great Bend. August 23rd. Yes, and October 18th we've got at Flint Oak Ranch, at Elk City. Is there any more business to come before the group? If not, we're adjourned.